question because we're going to be looking um, more into the psyche with William Rowlandson and Jules uh, Evans. <clears throat> um, so just a bit of background, um, William is currently lecturing in Hispanic studies at the University of Kent and is the author of a number of books on literature, um, Borges, Swedenborg, Mysticism, Psychedelics, The Imaginal and so on. And he's also the co-author of Daimonic Imagination uh, with Angela and is co-founder of the Canterbury Climate Action Partnership. So he's putting, as well as being a composter, vermifile and mycophile, if you know what the vermifile I means, you might need to explain that to us. And then Jules is a writer and research fellow at the Center for the History of the Emotions. It's amazing that such a department actually exists in Queen Mary University of London. And he's written a number of books, and most recently edited one on, on spiritual emergencies. Uh, and his book, The Art of Losing Control and Breaking Open, it's very interesting, just the, the, the opening and the vulnerability and the engagement, the deep engagement with life and its transformative power. And so, William, I think you're on first, so we'll hand over to you and very much look forward to what you have to share with us. Thank you very much, David. Um, and although I am scheduled first, um, um, this is actually, we've decided we're going to have a, a dialogue, Jules and I. Um, I haven't yet seen Jules. Jules, could you just say hello? Hi, Will. Great, you're there. Excellent, splendid. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon, Jules. Um, and thank you so much, Mark and David, for this fantastic day. It's, it's so far, it's been truly inspirational. Um, yes, and what was lovely about Mark is that uh, he gave us very little, brilliantly, he gave us little instruction um, in terms of how we should uh, organize our session. So Jules and I decided that... Um, rather like, I don't know, maybe rather like one of the um, Mark Vernon and the Rupert Sheldrake dialogues, which I've been so enjoying listening to. Um, perhaps we'd, we'd hold our session as a dialogue. And I hope it is, it, it, I hope it does work along that way. And it doesn't, it doesn't spiral into a peat and dud. <laughs> I hope we, we hold the, um, we hold this level of close engagement. But if it does, if it does become peat and dud, that'll be fine as well. It is after lunch. And so I appreciate that people may want to be taking their eyes off the screen. Um, I haven't prepared any visual material whatsoever. And I don't think Jules, you have, am I right? Right. So if you want to sit back, if you're, if you're interested in knitting or, or needlework or just, uh, just staring out the window, then now is an ideal opportunity to sit back in your armchair or your sofa or lie on the floor. Um, and uh, you don't need to see our, 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 our bearded mugs. Um, so um, w what we're going to be doing is we're going to speak for about 25 minutes now until about half past or so um, and leaving 15 minutes of our 45 minute session for a um, for, 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 for chat um, for he hearing people's um, chats in the conversation or as they raise them um, so we'll start with a couple of introductions and seeing as I've introduced the session perhaps Jules wants to introduce himself and then I'll come in and introduce myself uh, if that works Sure. Hi, Will. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's lovely to be here. I am speaking from Costa Rica, so it's just uh, eight o'clock here. Costa Rica is paradise. Uh, the snake in paradise is bad Wi-Fi, but um, I'm hoping that it all goes fine for the next 45 minutes. Um, for me, I would describe myself as semi-academic. Uh, so I work at the Center for the History of the Emotions, but I've got one foot outside of academia as well. I've always been interested in balancing the ecstatic and the Socratic, and trying to integrate different ways of knowing. Um, I sometimes uh, describe myself as a gonzo philosopher, which means I'm trying to balance like humanities research, critical research, but also with my own personal subjective um, experiences. So talking about my own like unusual experiences, but not uh, like a guru. So being open to multiple interpretations, not insisting on any particular one. Um, and one of my heroes in terms of the, the tradition of critical spirituality is um, the, the person that uh, Will and I are going to discuss today, which is Frederick Myers, um, who was the kind of co-founder of the Society for Psychical Research uh, and, and, a, and a bridge between uh, different ways of knowing and between 
you know, academia and alternative uh, ways of knowing. Oh yeah, and in my case, um, I put uh, in the in my biography that I put currently uh, a senior lecturer um, uh, in order to try not to define myself as being I am a um, something that uh, I learned from Alan Watts when he describes how we have a tendency to describe our profession as our state of being. Um, so this is what I do as opposed to what I am. Um, I've been working in two different uh, sort of strands of academia and I like what Jules just said as being an uh, as, as a as a gonzo uh, what, sorry you miss I'm a gonzo uh, philosopher um, and perhaps I like to think of myself as a gonzo academic I've never thought of that before but I like the idea um, and I'm committed as is Angela and in fact as is everyone here today committed to the understanding of that education is transformative um, and I feel that one of my principal understandings there is that all research and all teaching and all learning is always self-learning, self-research, self-teaching. But at the same time, as with the learning of any skills, one has to be able to separate. So therefore, if you're learning how to use a particular tool, um, yes, it is a degree of self-learning, but at the same time, I think to frame the learning of a particular tool, how to use a particular tool as a specific act of self-learning could be taking it a bit too far. And certainly in my role of teaching language, of teaching translation, of teaching literature, I, I'm conscious of, of steering a, a middle ground, that tertium quid, um, uh, between a full-on transformative experience that can arise sometimes and the understanding that it's also a a simple transmission of ideas and the learning of skills. Um, and I suppose over two decades of teaching at the, at the university, um, I've understood there's a, there, is a, 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 there, there are different ways to approach this. And with the, um, the MA in Myth, Cosmology and the Sacred uh, at Christchurch and now the center as we are represented today, um, that is where the full understanding of this self-reflexivity is, is fully manifest in the, in the work that we do. Whereas in, in other circumstances, it might just come as subtle moments. And where I've understood this primarily is through the transformative powers of literature. And in particular, and this is where I sort of chiming with some of the things that were discussed this morning, with literature that is not generally understood to be sacred. So what I often call the word, and, and, and using it in the way that Eric Davis uses, using the word weird and the weird experiences, the weirdness of literature, the weirdnesses that arise as being themselves windows into a, a wider realm of being. Um, that could be considered sacred if, if anyone wished to call it sacred, but it needn't be considered sacred necessarily. Um, and it's related to that, those, and those, those, those tangles that one can um, become involved in, those, those strange twists and turns in the narrative that then bring about a, uh, a meeting place between the author and the reader and the narrator and the character where, as I've expressed elsewhere, they meet as ontological equals. Um, and it's that threshold that I'm, in, I'm keen on exploring through, through in particular, through, through works of fiction, through works of short stories, through poetry. And it's there in the work that I do at the university that I'm always aware through reading people's essays, through the conversations that we have in seminars, how these little doorways, these, these subtle windows are sometimes opened. But of course, because the classroom, the seminar is not, although it may be therapeutic, it's not therapy. And it's important to remember that a classroom is not therapy and it changes its dynamics if it is considered therapy. But nevertheless, there is something therapeutic there. And therefore my, um, my approach, the approach that I've been really building on recently and over, over many years is exploring how these subtle uh, openings can themselves be related to a spiritual growth through a, a sense of development and through a sense that um, in a, a, a word that's, that's got so many meanings, I find it beguiling and also problematic, a word related to evolving, to read evolution. And I think this is where I'll, I'll, I'll draw to an end my little introduction and to pass over to Jules um, and see where you'll take that question about trans.
grounds for spiritual awakening and evolution. So this is what we're going to try and do. I'm going to speak about the Society for Psychical Research for five minutes. Then Will's going to talk about uh, Frederick Meyer's theory of the subconscious for five minutes. Will, after five minutes, I'm going to hold up my hand. <laughs> okay. And then we're going to discuss the idea of evolutionary spirituality and the work of Myers and how it runs as a thread through this culture that we're in. Um, okay, so Myers, Frederick Myers was a psychical researcher at the end in the Edwardian era. Uh, he was a Victorian and Edwardian ghost hunter. He was a coiner of the word telepathy. He was Aldous Huxley's favorite psychologist, a huge influence on William James and on the varieties of religious experience. James thought he wrote the first paper on the subliminal mind, or what became known as the subconscious, uh, long before Freud. Uh, in my own life, I'm a, a, a huge fan of Myers. I just can't understand why he's so little known, even in British psychology. I think he's one of the great British thinkers of the last you know, century or so. Um, I came across him through Jeffrey Kripal's great book, Authors of the Impossible. Uh, and I was so indignant at how few people knew about him that I dedicated The Art of Losing Control to Myers. Um, so he was the uh, he was a classics fellow at Trinity College, Cambridge at the age of 22. Um, but he left there to be an inspector of women's schools. He was a kind of progressive, big believer in female education. He was always in search of meaning. Initially, he was a Hellenist. You know, he kind of almost worshipped ancient Greek culture. But then he went to Greece and that did for that, really. Uh, he was then a follower of Wordsworth, who is another kind of alternative religion in the Victorian era. He then tried to be an evangelical Christian for a bit. Uh, that didn't work out. After he read Thomas Huxley and Darwin, he became disenchanted. Uh, he felt that uh, the kind of materialist theories led to a, a, a quote, a decline in any real belief in the dignity, the meaning, the endlessness of life. He was curious about spiritualism, which was a huge thing in the Victorian era. He was actually at a seance with Charles Darwin once um, and another one with Thomas Huxley. He was intrigued by some of the phenomena that happened at these seances. In one seance, a large hairy hand reached out and shook his own. Um, but he also came across a, a lot of humbug as well. And he wondered whether the spiritualist phenomena like in seances and so on, visions of the dead, um, could be explored scientifically using the scientific method. And one moonlit walk, he went for a walk with his mentor, Henry Sidgwick, a great moral philosopher at Trinity. And he asked him whether he thought this kind of spiritualist phenomena could be investigated scientifically. And Sidgwick thought it could. So he, Sidgwick and some others founded uh, the Society for Psychical Research in 1882. I believe it was founded at the house of Charles Darwin's cousin, Hensley Wedgwood, but we've got some SBR members here so they can correct me if I'm wrong. So it was this idea of extending the scientific method into the realm of the spiritual and the paranormal. Um, it was an attempt to try and find a middle ground between the dogmas of religions, including the religion of spiritualism and the dogma of science and scientific materialism to create a kind of um, empirical spirituality. Um, it was a, a very well connected group. Not one, but two uh, prime ministers were members of it. Arthur Balfour, who was the brother-in-law of Henry Sedgwick, also William Gladstone, author, also Conan Doyle, Tennyson, Marie Curie, William James, Bergson, uh, Freud. Um, but most of the work was done by what was known as the Trinity Group, which was Myers, Henry Sedgwick, uh, his wife, Eleanor Sedgwick, who is principal of Newnham College, uh, and, and some others, including Frank Podmore, the founder of the Fabian Society. Um, they went to hundreds of seances uh, and they would try to uh, investigate these seances and mediums and uh, phenomena critically. So, you know, perhaps Myers would go under the table at a seance and hold onto the legs of a medium so that she couldn't do or he she couldn't do any trickery. Um, so, uh, and sometimes, and they were often um, disillusioned by how much fraud they encountered in the spiritualist world. And some of their work was debunking one famous SPR report debunked um, poor old Madame Blavatsky uh, in, in India and it exposed her as a charlatan. It's a rather controversial report to this day. But they also encountered uh, a huge amount of genuine 
uh, phenomena that didn't fit into the materialist um, paradigm. In one enormous survey, they, for example, they found that 10% of the population experienced either visions of the dead or of loved ones in crisis. Uh, also, lots of genuine phenomena of, of information that turned out to be true being imparted in, in moments of crisis. The idea was to validate the ecstatic or the paranormal in defense against what William James called medical materialism, which would treat all ecstatic or unusual experiences um, as pathological, as just a merge order or delusions or somewhat. So the idea of the SPR was to, in some ways, kind of value all these are normal and natural and sometimes genuine, but but, uh, you know, uh, critical, you know, wary not to jump to conclusions. He th thought some information about people at seances that might not necessarily come from the dead. It might actually come from uh, telepathy, a, a word he coined. Um, he thought telepathy could be what he called a hidden potentiality, uh, a kind of latent power which humans have, which exists in the uh, subliminal mind. Uh, and I'll hand over to Will to talk a bit more about uh, that idea. Thank you very much, Jules. Okay, so I've been I've been spending some time um, recently staring out the window and probably dribbling a little bit, thinking about what really, um, if I had to take away one particular um, message from Myers, in particular from my reading of the human personality and its survival of bodily death, and that the the edition I used is the highly abridged edition. Um, that was um, uh, edited by his son, Leopold, in 1919. So it's, uh, it's kind of interesting to hold a, this book, which is exactly a, a century old. And it's, it, perhaps it's an easier edition to use because it doesn't have so much. Um, but at the same time, a lot is lost. And curiously enough, I found that one of my, one of my introductions to, um, to Myers was Jeff Kreiper, um, who writes about Myers very comprehensively. Um, but I had... I think I'd understood that the imaginal was treated with greater attention in Myers than perhaps it is. It's been expunged entirely from this edition here, which I find a very curious one. But if I had to come down to, if I had to sort of boil it down to a, to a workable set of something that I could put in my pocket and take away, um, I realize that I'm following with Myers the same position that I'm having in relation to um, the, 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 the weird um, uh, possibilities through literature. And that is, Myers sets out these very simple step-by-step -step, um, approaches to the work that he's exploring. And that is, does he say, does he says, does the mind exceed the brain? And the answer is yes. Okay, so the mind exceeds the brain. And how does he establish that? He established that by the thousands and thousands of cases that he and others in the SPR had compiled both in the, in the, in the proceedings and in the journal and obviously in um, the earlier work, uh, um, Gurney and Podmore of um, Phantasms of the Living, that we have powers and capacities that derive from this brain exceeding mind. And so what are they? And this is where, as Jules just pointed out, he, he came up with these extraordinary words, hundreds of words, um, telepathy being perhaps the best known, but one which I've been really paying attention to, and I think it's just wonderful, and I'd like to explore it further, but, but um, I'm at the beginning of this, and that is cosmopathic. Um, and I'll just throw that one out there. I'd love to hear people's response to cosmopathic. It's somehow, um, as, he, as he presents it from the glossary, um, which is actually, again, expunged by um, his son. So if you want the glossary, you have to go to an earlier edition, and that is open to the access of supernormal, which is another of his words, open to the access of supernormal knowledge or emotion, apparently from the transcendental world, but whose precise source we have no means of defining. Well, I sometimes feel that actually all the work that I do is related to this cosmopathic um, uh, endeavor, that there is certainly the sense of a calling beyond but it's not entirely certain what that beyond is and, and I adore that I think it's I think it's as it should be I think if things are too um, categories uh, too categorical and I think they can become they risk becoming too ideological and perhaps too dogmatic but back to this basic um, step-by-step approach if we do as he says have these capacities 
and he names them, such as telepathy, such as telesthesia, which is how he accounts for Swedenborg. Um, um, what service are they? What good are they? And this is where the question of evolution comes in. And one of the words he uses as an adjective quite often in um, the human personality is the word evolutive. And we find it again and again and again, this question of something which confers some evolutionary advantage. But it's never clear exactly what, um, despite his relationship with um, with T.H. Huxley and despite his relationship with, um, with Darwin and obviously despite his very close relationship with Alfred R Russell Wallace for whom the spiritual was a major component of evolution and indeed it was a major component of natural selection. For Myers he never, he never specifies with too much rigidity exactly what he understands um, evolution and evolutionary to be and there are some extraordinary things and I'll give you an example for example. Um, from human personality. This, this clear sense that humans are capable not only of accessing these, these greater uh, um, capacities that derive from the simple fact that our brains, our personalities exceed the vessel in which they are found, i.e. the brain and the body and the name and the context, um, um, that, that in so doing, we have the capacity of taking control of our own evolution, which is an extraordinary idea, an utterly extraordinary idea. But not only that we can, but that we must. And he says, and this is, a, I quote, it is of the evolution of human personality that this work proposes to treat of faculties newly dawning and of a destiny greater than we know. Now, I feel a parallel is there, and I'm sure Gary Lackman would be um, willing to explore that. I know he's not with us today, but he's, he's, he has explored that in relation to Colin Wilson's um, uh, articulation of, of the um, faculty X, this greater capacity that's usually um, encountered through um, in what Myers sees as both the um, subliminal and the supernormal. And there's obviously a, a crossover between the subliminal and the supernormal, and it's quite hard to distinguish at times between them. But so what do I think about this? How have I dealt with this? You know, could, is, uh, for example, telepathy, can we explore the idea of telepathy as conferring some evolutionary advantage? And if so, have they in the past? Um, are they in the present? Could they in the future? Well, first of all, this all depends on what we understand by evolution. And clearly, if we're looking at it from a strictly genetic perspective in terms of mutation, well, maybe not, because that, that, this is, that's a very specific understanding of evolution. And an evolution precedes Darwin, it, the, the name itself. And in fact, it's, it's cognate with evolve and revolve and devolve. And um, uh, it's, it, it, it has that, 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 that rootstock of volvere to turn. So it's interesting that the tropological that we've been discussing that, that Jeffrey talked about could be in there already with this question of turning. Um, but is there, so it may not be the case that we can look at it, unless, uh, certainly I'm not uh, qualified to do so. I'm very naive in these matters when it comes to genetics. I'm, I'm an autodidact with very little knowledge. Um, but when it comes to behavior, when it comes to um, uh, group behavior and individual behavior, well, yes, it does. And I, I'm, I'm very clear about this. And I, I'm going to try and explain this in a couple of minutes so as not to take up too much of this time, um, Jules. But very briefly, what I've been exploring now for many years, and I gave a series of talks for the Swedenborg Society over the summer specifically about this, and that is about consciousness and the way I have been presenting it, which is about true and woodland consciousness and it's perfectly appropriate um, that Louise should have done this wonderful um, imagining uh, work this morning with with trees and that is um, tree consciousness if we are like Myers if we are prepared to cross the threshold in which we understand that consciousness is an inherent quality in the reality if we are prepared to understand that our minds exceed the capacity of the brain and that they have a certain um, sovereignty a certain autonomy in this wider space then we can recognize as Myers did that there are personalities that are discarnate there are personalities that are not necessarily incarnate or if they are incarnate they are incarnate in for example a fiction they're incarnate in a um, ceremony they're incarnate in the imagination they're incarnate as Angelix described earlier in a statue 
Incarnation can take many forms, not just the organic body. And if so, if so, if we accept these postulates, then once we've crossed that threshold, once we've been through that window, once we accept the possibility that there is consciousness that forms itself into some degree of personality, into some degree of self-organizing principle that expands, that, is, that exceeds the limitations of material reality, then boom, suddenly everything is possible. Whether that be, as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle uh, explored with such tenacity, whether that be the Cottingley Fairies, whether that be, um, or as W.B. Yeats explored, or as, as W.B. Evans Wentz explored, or as Andrew Lang explored, um, you know, mediumship, fairy, um, the whole world of elves and pixies, or whether it be gods, the supreme being, him or herself, itself. All this is possible once we overcome that basic barrier, that first principle, and that first principle is, is this possible? Once we've overcome that principle, then all of this is possible, and it now depends on your own affinity, what Swedenborg would say, the community that you are drawn to, because communities are drawn to communities, souls are drawn to souls. Um, and it's that liminal space, and so, my understanding to, to conclude sorry Jules I've been a little bit longer than I was intending but that is that suddenly we are in this position where trees become conscious woodland becomes conscious now where does that lead us is there an ethic in that yes there is an ethic in that because as we're seeing now with the savage destruction in the um, for HS2 as we're seeing with savage destruction in the Amazon and elsewhere around the world it's very easy to destroy something that you take to be unanimate. It's very easy to clear away something that you have rendered an object um, with no sense of being. It's very much harder to cut a tree down that you treat as a friend. And I'll pass back to Jules. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to just um, make it, uh, three points just in the last, in, in a kind of three minutes or so, and then we can take some questions and, and bounce off each other. Um, so the first I'd say is, I, um, in terms of evolutionary spirituality, um, what I've been seeing in, in my research is the way that Darwin's theory of evolution um, didn't just debunk religions and religious worldviews. In some ways it created lots of new ones, lots of new faiths in a way, in a way. Um, various varieties of Darwinism, socialist, feminist, nationalist, capitalist, uh, and forms of kind of Darwinian spirituality. And that's uh, something that, that, that kind of is, defines the culture and new age of the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, you see that in, in Myers, you see that in um, theosophists like Blavatsky and Besant, Vivekananda tries to formulate some kind of spiritual uh, evolution. You see that in, in the Huxleys. And then after World War II, you see that in places like um, Esalen, uh, Michael Murphy, as, 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 as Jeff Kripal writes, has a kind of evolutionary spirituality. Uh, and, in, and in lots of others up to the present day in, in kind of contemporary spirituality. Um, and, and that's part of our culture. I just would say that there is, there is a, a risk to that culture as, as well. There's a potential shadow side. And the shadow side of it is that you see yourselves and your friends and your crew as part of the kind of evolutionary vanguard, this new emerging kind of super-powered human with these uh, latent potentialities fulfilled, physical, spiritual, psychic, and so on. Um, which is great if it's for everyone, but sometimes there's the question of, oh, is there just a few people who are the elite? Uh, we are the advanced ones. And then there are other humans who are like homo basicus or something, you know, they're, they're kind of backward. Uh, they haven't quite evolved. Uh, and occasionally there is an overlap with that kind of um, vision um, with, with eugenics or, you know, with the view, positive eugenics, we are evolving, the superhumans, but then also negative uh, eugenics, like the, the less advanced need to be controlled. So you, you see that sometimes in New Age spirituality. And I, I'd be curious whether, uh, you know, others have seen that kind of the risk. So there's a risk of spiritual inflation and then a kind of uh, an impatience or even a kind of contempt for the less advanced. And the other kind of provocation I'd throw out is, Myers, the, the project of empirical spirituality, which I'm so kind of, uh, you know, in favor of, and, uh, you know, has it succeeded 
over the last century. Myers thought that by the year 2000, there'd be so much evidence amassed that everyone would believe in life after death. There'd be established channels of communication with the dead, almost like uh, an email system. It would just become a regular thing of life. Um, in the 30s as well, there was the thought that the materialist paradigm had only years left and a more kind of, uh, you know, conscious centered paradigm would be established because of all the data that was being gathered by empirical spirituality and psychical research. I mean, I, mean, I wrote an essay called uh, Dude, Where's My Paradigm Shift in terms of like, what, how come this hasn't happened? So that's just a kind of provocation I've thrown out there. Why do we think that that hasn't happened um, yet? Uh, and, and, and I'd be interested whether people kind of think that there's that risk to evolutionary spirituality as well, that the risk of spiritual inflation or kind of impatience or contempt for those deemed less advanced. Yeah, and I'll just quickly throw in something there, if I may, Jules, before we open for questions. And that is, I completely understand what you've just said there. It makes a lot of sense. And that is reading Myers. Myers was so convinced that his work constituted this, this, this dazzling both revelation and revolution and he speaks with such conviction um, uh, on how future generations will build upon his this foundation well in a way he's been vindicated because we are here today building on that foundation but at the same time we can see that there is this cycle and i think jeffrey mentioned this earlier there is this cycle and uh, there's nowhere that i've seen this more brilliantly um, uh, manifest than in the fantastic collection of writing by Conan Doyle about the Cottingley fairies, which becomes really quite funny because Conan Doyle was totally convinced that photography was now going to be the final means of proving the existence both of the spirit world and his work with the College of Psychic Studies and Spirit Photography, but also obviously the photographs of the Cottingley fairies. And he's bombed. Fantastic. He's, he's, he's extraordinary. It's a bit embarrassing sometimes reading his, his account because he is so convinced. And as a result, he became blinded to his own, um, the reality around him. And that was that these, these photographs were, 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 were more tricksy than that. And, and again, my last little point is I have, and I know Jules, you have as well, because Jules and I, so I didn't mention at the beginning, we've come together um, a, a, with um, in the, the group, the wonderful group of Breaking Convention, which is um, um, the, 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 the biannual conference on psychedelic studies, which has been running now for a decade. Um, and one of the areas that we explore there that's been explored, and there's some, some very, very, very deep work involving um, MRIs and all sorts of technology, is the, the exploring, for example, um, the um, communication with the, the, the weird world, I'll use that expression, um, through the mediation of dimethyltryptamine, which is a, a, an extremely strong um, psychoactive. It's, it's the strongest there is. Um, and the possibility of plunging somebody into that state using an IV protocol that would keep them in that state for a long time. Now, I think that's wonderful research. But again, I sometimes pick up this sort of Conan Doyle-esque sense of now, finally, we can prove it. We can now finally establish this telephone, this hotline. And of course, that is exactly the narrative that we've seen going all the way back to the original table wrappings, it goes all the way back to Alain Kardec, it goes back further, it goes back further of, of every time that there is this, this, this revelation to an individual or to a group, there is this sense of now we've got it, now we can do it. And I'm interested in that, in that tension between the, the, the repetition of the cycle and some state of evolving some state of progress but um i'll have to end there so as not to eat up too much of the time well <clears throat> thank you very much indeed that's an incredibly stimulating um discussion and i feel that, that in terms of what some of the things you've been saying we've, we've we've almost got a sort of tension between william what you've been called the irresistible force and immovable obstacle and and uh, the one has kind of counterbalanced the other and and so the lid is still on um, as it were um, in spite of um, efforts to the contrary. Uh, another observation that I just wanted to drop in um, is I was talking about Gnosis this morning and one, one of the major spats as it were between the Gnostics and the Orthodox Church was that Gnostics were elitist. They said that the knowledge that you have 
um, that you you gain through this process of gnosis, which in, in in many cases involved a long and arduous training. It wasn't just kind of you couldn't get it get it by going to church on a Sunday, um, and they 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 they. So there is a sense of is are the people who are more advanced along the path, and um, and the thing about that I feel is that that to the extent that you are further along the path, you need to grow your humility at the same time. Um, otherwise, you fall into this hubris that you've been been talking about. So, and I, I uh, let's let's see if we can organise an event on Myers, and um, I, I think that would be terrific because I think he's 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 his work is is insufficiently known, neglected, uh, and um, I'm sure we could maybe do something sort of joint thing with the SPR. Uh, so, thank you very, both very much indeed, and let's let's just have some some questions. Mike, you you were first out of the blocks. Thank you. Thank you both. Yes, um, in reference to Jules's comment and question about um, the projection that there would have been by now a, an absolute conviction about knowing all this stuff. I work in um, mental health care. I'm a chaplain. And I just wonder whether you can comment both on how the Gnostic, maybe the Gnostic all knowing psychiatry of whether people are accepted for their exploration in their mind and their experience in society accepts the norm where many people manifest and therefore increasingly suspected and a threat and the opening their participation in society is through the doorway of psychiatry um, and incarceration and whether that is a statement of just how far we've got mm, thank you that's a Ready? phenomenal question Jules, well, very first, briefly or? um i think this is about a shift in power that happened in the mid 19th century from the church having authority over the soul to psychiatrists um, you know, Jean-Martin Charcot, the father of neurology, um, and, and, this, and part of that, unfortunately, ecstatic experiences became part of that battleground for authority, and people like Charcot and Henry Maudsley in the UK um, were happy to kind of deem um, ecstatic experiences as basically pathological. Um, and, and using, fo anyway, I reckon there's lots I could say about it. And I think Myers was ex and James were explicitly trying to go against that. Myers said, the adversary I have to, it, to my mind is someone like Mr. Maudsley, uh, who tried to, or Dr. Maudsley, who would convince people to connect religion and the madhouse. And James likewise was trying to very much go against that. Um, Humphrey Osmond, who coined the word psychedelic, said oh, it's, it's, he, he, he described Myers and James as psychology as the path not taken. Uh, and, and, and sadly, you know, psychiatry went another route. But I, I do hope things are changing. Of course, psychiatry is in, is in kind of a crisis at the moment. Um, and I think there's more openness um, to people's experience, uh, more of a kind of uh, pluralism. There's a lot more respect paid to lived experience. This is the kind of phrase that's often used now and to kind of um, survivor stories and to peer groups like the Hearing Voices Network and so on, yeah. Spiritual Crisis Network. Yeah, yeah. So I see some kind of hopeful signs. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, that's a brilliant response, Jules, and I concur entirely. And I think that um, uh, what Humphrey Osmond said is, is, is it's not just James and, um, and Myers, but you, you, although it, they, they are foundational, along with Pierre Janet as well. But we see the influence of, of James and Myers on, for example, Flournoy, and we see it deeply in Carl Jung. Um, I mean, it, Carl Jung is the best exponent of this understanding that the relationship between pathology and let's use the word that I've encountered recently, anomalistics, the anomalous, the yeah. weird, the strange. That relationship between pathology and, and, and anomalistics is too shade, too hazy to be easily defined. And of course, um, you use the word power there, Jules, and reading um, uh, Michel Foucault on, on the notion of madness is precisely this, that the, the transference of power um, does not grant power to the people who are deemed pathological. It's simply there are different people who are now deeming these people who hear voices pathological. And of course, psychiatry is in a crisis. And where I'm quite buoyed is by seeing 
for example, my good friend Ben Sessa um, down in Bristol and a number of others. And there's a lot of work going on both here in, at the, the Imperial College and in other parts of London, founded by the Beckley Foundation, um, funded, sorry, um, the work at the Beckley Foundation. There's lots of work going on here um, in the UK at the moment, looking at psychedelic psych psychotherapy. Now, one of the things about psychedelic th psychotherapy is the fact that the anomalous state of mind is explored as being absolutely central to the personal narrative and to the healing narrative and therefore in this in this in the sense of the medicine that's used um the medicine is just a catalyst it's not the medicine it's an opening of the door and where it's opening it's opening the door into pathological it's so often considered in order to silence that particular um, aspect of the psyche and therefore it's an it's an interesting angle that's being you know it's a sort of it, it, it has aspects of, of, of um, depth psychology it has aspects of all sorts of different streams coming flowing into it um, but it's in its early days primarily because of the continuation of this this ridiculous war on drugs which has caused so much damage around the world in so many different places um, but not least as, as as was well understood when it started to be closed down as Stan Groff writes about in the early 1960s is it suddenly silenced an entire way of treating um, the, 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 the diversity of the psyche and we can see how the decades that have ensued since the in particular the war on drugs but it's more than that um has streamlined this into a very clear distinction between what is what is aberrant and what is not and and i think mike this is exactly the hopefully this is the, the response to the question that you, you know this is this is part of that question and that is that with a deeper understanding and a deeper resonance of these ideas that myers and william james were exploring it's, and that, that's the beginning of Myers' book, Human Personality, is saying, you know, what people consider to be mad, gold lies in them hills. And it's uh, it, his sympathy to, to the people who have been deemed um, mad, his sympathy for them is, is tremendous, and it sings out from the text. Thank Brilliant. you very much, William. In fact, we've, <clears throat> we've now run out of time. Uh, and so what I, what I suggest, um, thank you very much for that long, um, <clears throat> very detailed response. Uh, is that the people who've got their hands up, could you put something into the chat? Could you make a point in the chat? And then maybe we'll be able to come back uh, towards the end to the questions that we haven't been able to look at yet. But if you have something that you can also share in the chat, that would be great. Uh, one thing I just wanted to say in, in, in response to your talking about Freud and Charcot and Maudsley, and I put into the chat a book called, a very uh, not at all well-known book now called The Law of Psychic Phenomena, uh, by Thomas J. Hudson, uh, which came out in 1890. And the, the full, vo full version is several hundred pages. I've only got a shorter version. I reviewed it in our journal a few years ago, and it was hugely influential on the New Thought movement at the time. And, and it's, it, the, the reason for bringing it up right now is that they, they, they look at the Nancy School. He looks at the Nancy School, which is a rival to Charcot, and they, they took these, um, their, these capacities that Myers is referring to very seriously, whereas Charcot and Freud you know, tended to be you know, reductionist and sort of medical materialist about them. And so I think that, that Hudson, this book, this book by Hudson is well worth a, a read, and I think it's a hidden, hidden treasure. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do now um, is... Uh, but we're just going to take um, a few, we're going to have a shorter break, but we wanted to uh, say something about the organizations who've been involved in today. Um, I know that Mark wanted to say something about um, uh, Perspectiva. I think we've got Jonathan Rosen on the call and the Fetzer Institute. And, and then also we've got the other S Angela's Center and the network. So we're just going to take a few minutes just to present, um, you know, give some context to the organizations that have been involved. Mark, would you like to take over from here? Yeah, thank you very much. It's just to draw your attention um, as well actually to the FETS Institute, um, for whom we have to thank once again, as indeed for the conference last year, Evolving Consciousness, for um, the generosity which we're able to pass on with the low um, entry fee, the low ticket price. I'm deeply grateful to them. Do have a look at their website. I'll put them in the chat in a minute. Um, they are a foundation found, uh, from John Fetzer, 
um, and sponsor all sorts of things from um, sort of hardcore science through to investigations of all sorts. Um, their latest actually is a very interesting um, large survey of spirituality in the US and um, which is both interesting to read for its own sake and to read against to get some sense of where things might be going. Um, so that's the FETS Institute. Um, and then also to mention Perspectiva, um, of which I'm an associate, um, and my work on spiritual intelligence is very much uh, funded and supported by them. Um, we're a, a loose group, a network really, of people from um, activists to performers, um, people more looking like academics, writers, um, came out of the project that Jonathan Rowson did at the RSA called Spiritualize, um, which is also worth a read. Um, we've got a new website, in fact, so I should put that in the chat too. Um, but um, thanks very much to Perspectiva for um, helping me be here today and uh, in support of the, um, the day too. Angela, would you like to say something about your centre? Yes, thank you, David. So the Centre for Myth, Cosmology and the Sacred is a continuation of the work that we've been doing on the MA programmes in Canterbury, which are now finally coming to an end um, next year. So the directors are myself, Mary and Louise, and William and Geoffrey and various others are also involved. And we're just now going global, really, with the kind of transformative learning that we've been promoting over the last 20 years or so. So our website, which will be up on the chat and available, um, contains an archive of our MA material and some of the dissertations and projects, amazing projects that students have done and also a whole host of lectures, webinars and upcoming courses next term. So do check into the website and we're very excited that we're now taking this project outside the university and um, making it available to a much wider community. Thanks very much indeed, Angela. I'm just going to share my screen, um, make sure I've got the right thing up. Uh, and just uh, run you through uh, some of the events that are uh, coming up for the network. Right, so I'll just run through this fairly rapidly. <clears throat> um, so our, the, our, uh, our webinars that we're doing every week, uh, they're on the theme One Mind, One Planet, um, One Health. Uh, and uh, we, we uh, encourage you, those of you who are not already uh, members of the network, you have a chance of joining at a, a reduced rate today, £50 for the year, which would include um, up through the end of 2021. And this gives you access to all of our videos, discounts to the live events, uh, three weekly Zoom calls that we have uh, for dialogue on a Monday evening, a virtual bar on a Friday evening, and then meditation with Peter Fennick on, on a Sunday evening. And we also have our journal, and which comes out three times a year and is mailed to all the members and with a very extensive book review section, as um, <clears throat> those of you will know. Where we, this year, we started a new monthly newsletter, which you can just sign up for uh, on free of charge on our um, list. You're probably all signed up for it already. And so I'm, we're just preparing the current issue just now. These are the dialogues that I already mentioned, um, which happen every week, and um, which are for members of the network. And then this is what we've got coming up. And so this week we've got all in the same canoe, indigenous approaches to consciousness and culture with uh, two native American elders, Apila Colorado and Leroy Little Bear, uh, who was also an associate of David Bohm. And so that's going to be a really interesting conversation, I hope. And then we've got two coming up on religion, spirituality, and then secularity and science. Uh, Elaine Howard Eklund is a colleague of Jeff Kripal's at Rice University um, in Texas. And then we've got P Professor Keith Ward um, of Oxford talking about his new book, Religion and Spirituality in the Modern World. And then um, we've got all of these events you can access on our, if you're a member, you can access all these recordings on our site. And so you can see the amount that we've been doing in the last few weeks. I won't go through them all. Um, and then this is our next uh, major event next weekend, um, which is also being run by the Galileo Commission. 
And I'm delighted to say that we've just received an assurance of funding for another three years for this project. So the primacy of consciousness, the next great scientific revolution, question mark. And these are the authors of this volume that's coming out, which is called Is Consciousness Primary? And we're sending out press release to the mainstream this week in the hope that uh, we might get some interest for this as well. And this, this then leads you into the Galileo Commission, um, which I've just been talking about, expanding the science of consciousness beyond a materialistic worldview. Undoubtedly, Myers and William James would have been supporting um, this uh, initiative. Uh, and we've got a lot of, uh, got 90, nearly 100 of the original advisors um, from 30 universities. So do go to the site. And if you're an academic, um, please sign up as a professional affiliate to join our 200 professional affiliates, 209, I think, as of today, or 211. Um, and if you just have a general interest, please go and join as a friend. You just need to go to GalileoCommission.org, join us, and I'll put that into the chat. Uh, so, uh, and we also have our, our social media platform. So this, that's just a, a quick, quick cook's tour um, of, the, of the network. Do join our community if you haven't already done so. Um, we, we are um, trying to, uh, you know, go along this path of evolutionary spirituality that, that we've been talking about and trying to, to marry up this, this critical reason with, with um, deep inner knowing. Uh, so I think I'd just like to um, end by thanking our two speakers for their very penetrating analysis and presentation of uh, these important ideas um, <clears throat> of uh, Frederick Myers and for raising so many interesting questions. Each of these could be a session in itself. Uh, so Andrew, I think we'll, we'll take um, a five minute break um, and then we'll come back for and the uh, interview and dialogue with, uh, with Jeff Kripal, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, thanks very much indeed.